everybody. I am Kurt and this is Debbie. We're from New Hope Christian Fellowship. I want you to join us. Let's worship the Lord together, shall we? Let's do it with a thankful heart as we lift up our voices. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all kings. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. Lift your voice from the rising to the setting sun. His love endures forever. By the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. today just to remind us that God is faithful. You need to know God is faithful. You may think all around you stuff is happening, but I want you to know God is faithful. And today we're talking about giving thanks. And so I want you to instill in your heart right now a heart of thankfulness and recognize we can be thankful because God is with us and he's forever faithful. Let's do that third verse one more time, shall we? Lifting up our voice, shall we? From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. His love endures forever. Believe it. His love endures forever. Keep saying it. His love endures forever. One more time. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing. Praise. Sing Forever. 
God is faithful. That is a, a sure thing we could rest our life on. And in his faithfulness, he keeps showing himself to us. And we can receive joy and life because he is good. Sing this with me. You are enthroned above the heavens, the earth and all creation. With strength and glory, the angels cry holy. All surround you, forever you will stand. Your kingdom has no end, O oh, holy God. I stay. recently let's give thanks lord we just want to thank you that you keep loving us thank you lord and in in your love for us you allow us to bring needs before you i know i just know people who are watching this they need your touch and i can't fathom the the breadth and the enormity of some of the needs that some of these people have i just pray that you will make yourself known to them and that you will love them You'll anoint them, anoint them for healing, anoint them for life. I pray that you'll rebuke the devourer. Let them be held back. Let the darkness be held back and let the light of life, the light of the Lord just shine through them. Bring healing, bring life, bring peace, bring joy. And we will thank you. 
I pray as well, Lord, there will be a greater connectivity of the people of faith. In these days, as it says in Hebrews, in these days, we need to exhort one another and connect with one another. And as that early church did, they were filled with awe. So I pray that today we will be connected one with another and we indeed will be filled with awe. Thank you, Jesus. We praise your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, before we go, this is the last Sunday of the month. And because it's the last Sunday of the month, we got to sing happy birthday. Would you join me? No, by the way, it's, it's happy birthday to those people who had a birthday this month. This has been the month of February. And so all of you who had a birthday this month of February. Now, if you were in church today, I would share with you that you can get a, a little bag of jelly bellies. But since you're not in church, I just want to sing you this song. It goes like this. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Just a couple of announcements before we open the word and, and share about giving thanks. But let me just share with you, thank you for joining us today. And if you're a guest, if you... If you've never participated with us before, thank you so much. And on your screen, you see a QR code. I would really enjoy hearing from you. Just scan that QR code on your phone that takes you right to a Connect card and you can put your name in there and you could put your email address or whatever you want and just allow us, allow me to send you a note and uh, let us know that you're there. That Connect card is just great. And I just hope that you'll do that. And also, I want to thank you for your giving. Be faithful in your giving. I, I'm reminded of that verse of David where he says, you don't offer the God that which cost you nothing. There's something about sacrifice that opens up our heart to the presence of the Lord. And so I'm asking you to give today. And as you give, God will bless you with his a greater dimension of his presence, but you will also bless the ministry that will help us to go forward in our world for the cause of Christ. I wanted to share with you that tonight, February 27th, tonight, we're having our, our membership meeting and I'm asking every member to come to this very crucial meeting. Why? Because yes, we'll be selecting board members, but we are going to be presenting to the membership bylaws. We are changing, we are pro proposing a change to our entire bylaws. This is a total rewrite. And it's important that every member come because every member, I think, is important to making this decision. It starts at five o'clock. And as you know, bring a refreshment. You could bring a, a little dessert or if you want to bring a finger food, whatever, but bring a dessert or, or fresh uh, uh, finger food in order to share with everybody. It begins at five o'clock. And I think it will be a wonderful time as you join us there. Every year as we approach our business meeting, I, I love picking out a theme. And I did the same this time. You know, as, as I've looked past over this past year, can anybody not deny this has been a tough year? Can, I, can anybody not deny the things that we have gone through? And so I thought it would be good to approach this year and as this theme with the theme of giving thanks, giving thanks. In that light, I, I begin to think of all of the stuff that everybody has gone through and all the things that people have gone through in their lives. And you know, I think it seems like, I should say, this past year, there's been an increase in fear. There's been an increase in anxiety. There's been a, a toughness that's taken place in terms of relationships, a, a uh, uh, fragmented relationships and or maybe in your life you're dealing with habits in your life that need to be broken or or feelings of inadequacies inadequacies in your life and weaknesses that you're dealing with so many things that we as a people go through in our humanity the battles that we face the dreams that we want to have and, and the other things that the needs that seem to be creeping up you know, each of us as individuals are going through these types of things. Now, since the church is made up of individuals, I would submit to you that the church as well 
is going through these very similar things, that the church is facing fears and anxieties. The church at large is facing issues with relationships and, and even church habits. You know, a church can fall into habits that really are not beneficial for the church. And how do we break those habits? Or we as a church can feel inadequate and weaknesses that develop within us. And even battles that can rise up and unfulfilled dreams and, un and unfulfilled expectations. You know, as a church, we are going through these things. And it seems to me like these things have heightened this past year. With that in mind, I thought I wanted to address giving thanks. And I'm going to tell you in advance what I have just three points that's going to be supported. But let me give you three points. Number one, bring in his presence. Number two, give thanks. And number three, conquer your issues. Number one, bring in his presence. Number two, give thanks. And then lastly, conquer your issues. With that in mind, we're going to be starting in, in the First Chronicles. We're in chapter 13 and following, looking for First Chronicles chapter 13 through 17. And in this we see that this was a time in which it refers back to when the Ark of the Covenant, if you remember the Ark of the Covenant, was the, was the uh, container that contained the Ten Commandments, that contained the Aaron's rod that budded, speaking of his leadership, it contained the pot of manna. But more so, it was, a, it was the representation of the presence of God. Now you and I know you can't contain the presence of God in a box. It was a representation of the very presence of God. And God himself dictated how that box was to be made and, and how the lid was made out of solid gold and the, and the seraphim, the angels that were on top of that box. It, was, it represented the very presence of God. And if you look back at the time of Eli, when I, Eli was the priest, the Israelites were at war and they were losing the war. And you know what they did? They, they decided to take the Ark of the Covenant out to battle. Frankly, they looked at it as a good luck charm. And as a result of their mistreatment of the ark, the ark was taken by the Philistines. Israel lost the battle. Eli died. His two sons died. And the ark was carried away. It was out of that that uh, the daughter-in-law of Eli had a child, and she named that child Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. Departed, speaking of how the Ark of the Covenant was taken captive by the Philistines, an ungodly nation. Well, the Philistines took that Ark of the Covenant and they placed it in Dagon's temple. And as you could remember, if you read the story, it's a wonderful story. There is Dagon standing and the Ark of the Covenant. The next morning, they come by, back and Dagon is on his face. I, I love this little line that they put Dagon back on his stand. And you know what happened the next night? Dagon had fallen again, and his head was severed, and his hands were broken off of that idol, indicating no god could stand before our god. Well, in the course of time, they passed that Ark of the Covenant between the five different cities of the Philistines, and everywhere that Ark of the Covenant went, there were diseases that came upon the people, and they began to suffer. Until one time, they decided, it's time to send this thing back. And so you know what they did? They made a, a brand new cart, and they put cows that had just calved, and, and they attached those cows to that cart, and they put the Ark of the Covenant on that cart and sent it away, and that cart went directly back to Israel. When it came back into Israel, they rejoiced, and they parked it there in a city called kiriath Jerem, and there it sat for around 100 years. It sat for around 100 years, and it went through the, the kingdom of Saul. The, when Saul was king, that Ark of the Covenant remained there, and then David became king. When David became king, and when Israel and Judah was united, David had this desire to bring the Ark back into Jerusalem. He had established Jerusalem as the seat of his government, and he wanted the seat of God's presence to be there in Jerusalem as well. And so after he had taken Jerusalem from the Jebusites, he made it the capital, and now he wanted to make the seat of his presence. And so he made, he made the plan to bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem. And there he made a cart. And he put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart. And 
he brought, he began to bring it back. And as you know, the ark stumbled, the oxen stumbled, which caused the, the, uh, the cart to jiggle or whatever, whatever it did. And Uzzah reached out to study the ark and Uzzah was slain dead because indeed nobody was to touch the ark. David takes the ark and he's angered by this whole thing and he places the ark in the home of Obed-Edom because he didn't know what to do. And he went home and he asked this very important question, what can I do to bring the presence of God back? It says there in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, David feared that God that day, the day that Uzzah died, and he said, how can I ever bring the ark of God to me? Here's what he's saying. How can I ever bring the presence of God to me? It's a great question that we ourselves should ask. What, should, what can we do? What should we do to bring the presence of God to me? There is no doubt that the presence of God is everywhere. But there's also no doubt that not all of us are in tune to the presence of God. So what can we do to heighten the pres the, our sensitivity to the presence of God in our life? David looked back at Obed-Edom. Well, when, remember the Ark of the covenant was at Obed-Edom's house or place. And the Bible says that Obed-Edom was blessed as a result of the presence of the ark there. David looked at that basically with envy. He said, how can I be blessed? And what's it going to take to bring the ark of the covenant back to him? Why? Because his desire was his, the Lord's presence. And why, you might ask? Because there is this innate call within each and every one of us to have the presence of the Lord within us. But also there's great benefit because of the presence of God. Moses himself, in his Exodus chapter 33, when God is speaking to Moses, gives us a benefit. He says, and he said, and this is God speaking, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now that's not talking about sleep. It's talking about everything will be in order. I will put everything in order and you will be at rest because of my presence being with you. David himself speaks of the presence of the Lord and the benefits that come as a result of the presence of the Lord. He says, in your presence, in Psalms, Psalms chapter 16, in your presence there is fullness of joy. Early on in that verse is you have made me known to me the path of life. In your presence there's fullness of joy, and at your right hand there are pleasures evermore. He's seeing this. When the presence of the Lord resides in us, he sets out a path for us. And in that path, there's pleasure, there's joy, there is all that is needed in our life. He goes on in Psalms chapter 105, verse 4, he says, Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. His desire is to pursue the presence of of the Lord. Now, what do we do when we, when we have troubles in our life? We pursue how-to books. We pursue uh, uh, lectures. Now, I'm not denying those things are important, but they need to take their priority underneath the priority of God. We need to seek his presence. Seek ye first, the kingdom of God says, and then all these things will be added unto you. So when you're, when you're uh, led by his spirit, when you're, I would say, compelled by his presence, he will lead you to the information and to the teaching and to the truths that come from his word in order to bring about life to your spirit. Psalms 27, he says this. He says, there's one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most. It is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. He's talking about living in the dwelling of God. He's not talking about pitching his Kent tent in a church somewhere. He's talking about having and, and the abiding presence of the, of the Lord in his life. He says also, for he will conceal me there when troubles come. He will hide me in his sanctuary. He will not place me out of reach on a high rock. And then I love this confidential statement. He says, when I will hold, then I will hold my head high above my enemies who surround me. His, the confidence that he has as a result of the presence of the Lord. So with that in mind, all that, the desire of his presence, and indeed this is our first, first point here, 
seek his presence. How did he bring the Ark of the Covenant back into Jerusalem? How did he bring the presence of the Lord to him? First of all, he prepared a place for the Ark. He established a tent. He erected a tent. This was where the Ark was going to go. Now, it is true that later on he says, how can God live in a tent when I live in a house? That's a whole other story. We're not going to deal with that today. But I just say it's important for us as well to prepare our tent, to prepare our habitation for the presence of the Lord. It was not just going to come. It was going to come to a specific place. And I'll share with you that specific place is within us because the Lord wants to dwell within us. Secondly, he declared Jerusalem as a center of prayer and praise. I would suggest that we need to declare to the spirit realm, to all, to all, even all the world around us, that we are the dwelling place of God. And our purpose is prayer and praise and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to make that declaration. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. I would suggest to you that we make that similar type of declaration in our own life. We have committed ourselves to being people of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, he established that the priests were to carry the ark. This was important. You see, the problem was they built a new cart in order to put the cart to put the ark on. But God had already dictated that the ark was to be carried on the shoulders of the priest. And so David went back to that original instruction from God. He says, no, the ark is not going to be carried on a new cart. The ark is going to carry, be carried on the shoulders of the priest. How does that relate to us? We are now the priest. We are now the servants of the Lord. We are now the ones who indeed are priests to the world. And by, as such, we cannot trust a new cart to carry. We have to trust God and carry the cart ourselves. If I could just digress here just for a moment, how often do churches look for newfangled ways, the new cart? How often do churches look for the fresh thing or the fancy lights or whatever it might be when all along, listen to me, it's the people of God that carry the presence of God. It's the people of God that carry out the purposes of God. We cannot lose sight of our call to worship the Lord and to be his ambassadors. So he established once again that the priests were indeed to carry the ark. I think that is our call. We need to carry the presence of the Lord. Next, he declared that the priests were to purify themselves in order to walk in the power of his spirit, in order to walk in the power of his presence. There is the presence of the Lord that needs to come to us and be pure, and we need to be pure in order that the presence of God might live within us. Next, he established a team of worship, of worship that would precede the ark. And that team went out ahead of the ark, and they sang worship to God. You know what this tells me? It tells me something that, that all through Scripture, worship is important to the presence to dwell. When we worship the Lord, it opens up our spirit that the presence of God would dwell in us. Worship precedes the ark. Even in our own life, worship precedes the infilling and the presence of God in magnanimous ways. Then they offered sacrifices. The Bible says that they offered uh, animals as a, as a sacrifice for sin, but there was also another type of sacrifice. It's called the fellowship offering. It was an offering that was de designated as a result of the restored fellowship that they had with God. When we serve the Lord and when we offer sacrifices, whether it be through our giving of funds or service of people and whatever it might be, it's an indicator that God dwells within us and it is indeed the act of thanksgiving whereby we offer praise unto the Lord. And then lastly, what happened was David unreservedly, unreservedly offered worship to the Lord. He led the procession. The Bible says he tore off his clothes and danced before God. Remember his wife, Michael, who was up in, the, up in the window, said, boy, you've made yourself a spectacle today. How often 
God wants us to be totally unabandoned to him. And yet how often do we allow the, the, the scorn of people to make us feel ashamed for doing that? David unashamedly worshiped the Lord. I suggest to you, the presence of the Lord comes to us when we unashamedly sacrifice ourselves to him, that he would be our God. All of this David did, and he put it into motion. And as he did, the train came into Jerusalem, was put in its place, and then David gave thanks. When the presence of God came, David gave thanks. If you look at 1 Chronicles chapter 16, it says, On the day that David decreed for the first time that thanks be given to God, to the Lord, by Asaph and his relatives. And look at these words that I highlighted. He gave thanks. It was a priority. The priority of the presence of the Lord was a heart of thanksgiving. And then he says, call on the name of the Lord. When we, when we give thanks, we're calling on God. We're, 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 we're thankful for things that happen around us. But listen, it all is sourced from God. It all comes from him. Give thanks. And this is proclaim. Acknowledge that God is the source of everything. You realize that when you acknowledge that it is God, you are in essence giving thanks to him. You are praising the Lord for what he has done in your life. And then it says, sing to him. Singing is an expression of the spirit. And when we sing, it is our spirit that is connecting with him in thankfulness. And it goes on and uses these other words, tell, which speaks of declaring and, and rejoicing and seeking and remembering. And then there's verse 13, which says, you offspring of Israel, he's saying this, your heritage is one of God, and because it's one of God, you need to declare the praises of the Lord. It's in your, it's in your nature, it's in your DNA to praise the Lord. Give thanks for him. You see, it was after the presence came that they gave thanks, and they gave thanks to him. Well, after that, after the presence came, and after they gave thanks, I love this uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 18, verse 1. It says these two words, after this, after all of this, look what happened. David defeated the Philistines. He subdued them. And he took villages from the Philistine control. And it says, and he also defeated the Moabites, and they became David's subjects. Verse 3, David also defeated the king of Hadadezer. And he, verse 4, David captured 1,000 chariots and 7,000 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers from him, hamstrung all the horses and kept 100 chariots. And on and on and on and on it goes. Here's my point. Because the presence came into his life and because he was grateful, truly grateful in his heart for what God has done, he received victory. He defeated. He defeated. What are you facing today? Remember that list I put up? What are you dealing with today? What are the issues that are, that are, that are, that are weighing you down? Let me share with you that as you allow the presence of God to come into your life and as we give thanks, we will indeed defeat these things. We will defeat fears. We will defeat anxieties. We will defeat the separation that has taken place in relationships. We will break those habits in our life that need to be broken. We will, we will feel the confidence of the Holy Spirit within, within us that will deal with our inadequacies. Why? Because our strength comes from Him. We will deal with the weaknesses that we have. We will deal with the battles and the dreams that, that need to come and the needs that we have. We will deal with unfulfilled expectations, both as an individual and as a church. I share with you that as a church, it's been, it's been tough. Not, not, and I'm not discouraged in any way. I'm just saying there's been a change that's gone on. As you know, across the nation, some people are not coming back to church. Or across the nation, and it's affecting us too. But I want to share with you that we have indeed great needs, even as a church. We have a need for souls to be saved. We have a need for different things to be done around the church, like help with audio-visual, and even as simple as managing our bookshelf. And 
We, we're praying for a daycare to be established right here in our church. The simple repairs that go on throughout the church, you know, all these things. These are issues that we're facing and sometimes I go, Lord, what are you gonna do? But I share with you this, my confidence comes from the Lord. And I know this, as we allow his presence to come in, and as we give thanks to him as according to the scripture, I believe these needs will be met. Why? Because people will be directed by the Lord. And the fears and the anxieties that individuals face, the fears and anxieties that a church may face, when we allow the presence of the Lord to come into our life, great things will happen. So in that light, I just encourage you today to offer the Lord thanks. Offer the Lord praise. Let it come right from the depths of your heart. Now, sometimes you click off of this and you move on, but I don't want you to do that right now. I want you to sing with me, and I want you to engage with this song that simply says, I am giving you my life, Lord. I desire your presence more than anything because I do have all these needs and I do have all these issues. And I want you to know that as you give thanks to the Lord, his love will endure forever in you. Sing this song with me. It's called Unbroken Praise. Praise unbroken. Praise unending. Be yours. Be yours forevermore. Praise untainted. Praise unfading. Be yours, be yours forevermore. Be yours, be yours forevermore. Unbroken praise be yours, God, forever. All my praise be yours, God, forever. Jesus, we give you our lives. We give you our hearts. Our desire, Lord, is to make a declaration right here and now that as for me, we're going to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. We ask you to come and dwell in our hearts. We ask you to come and do within us, work out within us the purposes and the means and the power of God. And Lord, we give thanks that you do that within us knowing this, that you will work out. You will work out these stuff. You will work out the, the strained relationships between husbands and wives. You will work out the issues that we are having our children. You will indeed instruct us on how we are to handle our money. And, and Lord, you will do all of these things as we give you praise and we give you honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Wow. Let the presence of the Lord be in you. Ephesians gives us wonderful blessing. 
It says, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I pray also, grab this, I pray also that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand. That same God resides in us. I pray the joy of the Lord in you today. Have a great week this week.